Well, hello. It's, uh, it's great to be here again as we celebrate the risen Lord and as we uh, try to discover what the instructions of Jesus were, not only to his followers, but to us today, who are, by the way, I guess we are still his followers, aren't we? After Jesus was taken up into heaven, and they were standing, looking up into the sky, uh, suddenly the scripture says, two men dressed in white stood beside them. And men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand there looking up into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into the heavens, will return in the same way you have seen him go. And just like that, the promise of the second coming came to be. Uh, there's no other place that I understand in Scripture before this point is there any mention of Jesus returning. And, uh, and so here we have it, uh, a prophecy from the angels. Well, the disciples returned, and in verse 12 it says uh, that they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. And when they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying, and those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. And they all joined together constantly in prayer with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers, which was very interesting uh, to see that his brothers, who uh, doubted him through his whole entire ministry, now have become believers. And uh, at least one of them, James, would become a leader in the church, and we'll see him more active later. But how did they wait? You know, in saying they all joined together constantly in prayer, it gives us a picture of, of unity and active obedience of the Lord's instructions to wait for the promise. They did not just sit there and, and drum their fingers on the table saying, well, okay, Lord, we're here. No, they persisted in prayer as they had seen the Lord do so many times in those three years they walked with him. And the common purpose would be that, that qualifying characteristic of their life through that development of the, of the early church. They would devote themselves to, to prayer and to corporate prayer until God answered. And he would certainly answer in such a dramatic way in just a few short weeks. This is surely a lesson for us today in the New Testament church. You know, we constantly want to see God move, and, and rightly so, because he, his promises are real and true and for us. But we must uh, qualify ourselves to be praying and to be asking and to be seeking him. Because he says, of course, in the Old Testament, you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Now we move to the portion of Acts now um, where the death of Judas is recorded and the appointing of Judas's replacement. Now if you, if you look at verse 15, it says, In those days Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and uh, he said to them, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David, concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in this ministry. And with the reward he got for his wickedness, Judas bought a field, and there he fell headlong. His body burst open and all his intestines spilled out. And everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called the field in their language, Acheldama, that is, field of blood. And so Peter goes on to say in verse 20, that it's written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted and there be no one left to dwell in it. And again, may another take his place of leadership. And so, uh, you know, that, that part of, uh, of, the, uh, of the, the story of the disciples and their waiting uh, was really set the stage for a replacement. Uh, you know, so there in verse 21, it says, Therefore it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must be a witness with us of his resurrection. And so they proposed two men, Joseph called Barsabas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. And then they pray. So this, this is a part of, uh, that's a little bit interesting, you know, in terms of what did the disciples do? They, they had 11, you recall back in, in the Gospels where Jesus would send them out two by two, 
and uh, now he only had 11, you know, if he's going to send them out in that, in that particular, even though there are 120 in that room, the disciples or the apostles were something a little bit unique and distinct, and they, they were the 12 chosen, now 11, and so they proposed Matthias, and, uh, and you know, and it was interesting too, because Jesus declared to them early on, when they, he was walking with them back in uh, Matthew 19, that that those 12 disciples, or the 12 disciples, were going to sit on the 12 thrones and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. So it was quite crucial in their minds anyways, in their thinking, to bring this, this about. And, and so they chose Matthias. And, uh, and how did they choose him? Well, <laughs> we'll get to that in a minute. But, but uh, Peter stated in, uh, in verse 21, it's necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord went in and out among us, beginning at John's baptism. So that, that's the very beginning of Jesus' ministry for the last three years. Matthias must have been among them, even though we don't see him recorded his name in other places. So he became to be included. And according to tradition, Matthias died in uh, around 80 AD, and by some accounts at least was an apostle to the nation of Ethiopia. Uh, so for about 50 years after the crucifixion and after he was selected, it seems he served Jesus until his death. But the focus on his being chosen and the reason for him to be even considered was his relationship with the Lord and his faithfulness. We can take from that that Matthias was a, a, a really a man of action, a man of faithfulness, those who followed the Lord over the long haul. And, and the definition of faithfulness by, in and of itself is, is, is continuity or consistency and perseverance. So we must remember this was the formation of the early church. And uh, they, they were really putting a lot of emphasis on trustworthiness and what was going to be testified to because you see the people of the day would have known a lot of what was going on. They would have witnessed the followers of Jesus and they would not have been fooled by someone claiming to have been with Jesus if he really wasn't. And so that's very important. So the selection of his replacement was to fulfill scripture and not just to create a religious class. That's why Judas' uh, sad ending is mentioned. Being one of the chosen and yet being one of the 12, he must be replaced. So two names are mentioned, as we've already said, Barsabas and Matthias, and they prayed to the Lord. And this is another interesting aspect. They prayed to Jesus to help them choose the right person. The position was to be an apostolic ministry and what is an apostolic ministry, you might ask? It's a ministry of going, of carrying the message of Jesus to the world around them and to the uttermost ends of the earth as they've been instructed. And so as you see here, we have an example of the Lord, Lord's plan being put into action. And it's the only plan he would accept because he wouldn't accept the human plan, of course, this is God's plan. And the apostle Judas was shown to be unfaithful and was removed from his position. And it did not end well for him. Matthias was chosen to carry on the mission of the gospel in his kingdom, and it came to a, a very powerful uh, realization. This is a reality check for us in the church today. You know, like the parable of talents, the, the five and the two and the one, those who were faithful to put into play the, uh, the master's work, uh, if you recall the, the talent of the, of the, uh, the parable of talents, where the one with five came back and he presented uh, five more. And uh, the master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, and the uh, same with the one with the two talents. He brings back two, but you know what happened to the one with, the, with only brought back the one who hid his talent, didn't reproduce it. And uh, because of that, it was taken from him. He was cast out and the talent was given to the one who already had 10. And so uh, it's all about being faithful in doing the master's work. And that's, that's for you and I as well. God's plan for his creation in this world will take place with or without us. That's a very real, very real uh, constancy in God's plans. He chooses the people who will follow him, who will love him, who will obey him. And if we don't do that, then he chooses someone else. Now, I recently heard a teaching about, uh, about this kind of thing as we uh, are walking through this crazy time in our world called the, the pandemic world. And uh, one of our, uh, our, our president of our denomination, actually, Steve Jones, he, 
he was speaking of this last uh, Tuesday at a conference I was at, and he gave us four Ps, and I'd like to share them with you because they're really pertinent to this, uh, to this whole idea of faithfulness. And those four Ps, <clears throat> he said, he asked us to write them down in a linear page, like purpose, people, programs, and property. And what does that represent? Well, our purpose, as for the Christian church, if we're obeying Jesus and the Great Commission, is to go out with the message. That's our purpose. And the people that we are to go to, well, they're to everyone in the world. The programs, well, they're methods that work, that, that uh, carry out the purpose. And the property, of course, just represents places to affect the delivery of that message. As you're well aware, we're in one of the most challenging times of church history, in our generation at least. We've not seen the like of it, but, uh, but many through the ages have. Uh, they've seen situations like this. And if you look around at the churches that are, that are mainly focused on programs, or they have to congregate in certain times in certain areas, they're not doing so well in this last year or two. But the ones that have a continuity of purpose, the ones that focus on purpose and getting that purpose into the people, um, they're doing all right. And, uh, and, you know, and that can be really understood one way, that the Lord is going to make a way if we focus on his purpose. The message of the risen Christ and his victory over death is timeless, and, and it, it doesn't require a building or a program to exercise. It doesn't select any type or class of people. It doesn't depend on a strategy or methodology in presenting this truth. And it certainly does not require a building to which to be effective. I dare say more people have given their life to Christ and a confession or need to repent in a, um, in a coffee shop or, or in a, a neighbor's apartment or uh, on a napkin in, in, a, in a restaurant. Uh, you know, living room, any, anywhere. Um, look at the crusades of Billy Graham and Luis Palau and different ones, even that of the old timers like Billy Sunday. Most of these were in sports stadiums or convention centers. They weren't in worship houses. So the building is irrelevant. The programs are only a tool, and the people are, whoever may here can come. To, but the purpose remains the same. This is what makes faithfulness, even in a pandemic, possible. And that's why Matthias was selected to replace Judas, because the purpose of getting out the gospel was paramount to everything else. The scripture had to be fulfilled. The leadership to bring the mission forward must be restored to its full strength. Now, to be sure, it might surprise us a little on how the selection is carried out. Uh, the scripture says that they cast lots. After they had prayed, they, they placed two names on stones, Joseph and Matthias, put them in a container of some sort, shook it up, turned it upside down, and when the name came out, presumably in a face-up or readable position, it was seen to be the one the Lord had chosen. And you would say it was by chance that Matthias was chosen? Well, not really. Because if you believe uh, that, you're, fo you're failing to take into consideration uh, that they had prayed in faith, believing and the, the Lord would choose the person that he had in mind. Uh, so to believe in a sovereign Lord is to throw off any thought of luck, because uh, luck requires a universe that has no master. It means that there's no plan or think that the things just happen by chance. And that is not the world of a believer in an almighty sovereign God, an omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God. That's, that's the world of Darwinism, if you believe in luck. That's the world of pagan philosophy. Because if you search scripture, you do not find the concept of luck anywhere. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And it's he you will encounter here in the scripture. The God who made the universe and everything in it, it's he you'll read about. And a Holy Spirit that is alive and active and empowers those who serve the risen Christ, it's he you'll see engaging through the faithful followers and making God known to the ends of the earth. And you'll read about the faithfulness of the saints, the called out ones, who do not need a certain building to be faithful and to share the message of life. 
a group of people who are faithful to the message to proclaim it regardless if it's called Sunday school or outreach or visitation or church or any other name you want to put to it. You'll find the people committed to their fellow man no matter what. And regardless of their shape, size, color, origin, it doesn't matter. Because Jesus, you know, once Jesus remarked, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? Well, I would like to say that I hope it's found in you and I. That that will be found faithful to be giving the message. Because you see, that's the purpose of the resurrection. The resurrection to send the power of the Holy Spirit to the disciples so they can take that that message out. That's purpose. And if we stick to that, we'll find kingdom building going on everywhere. Your name may not be Matthias, but oh, what a legacy he had. Not failing, but faithful. And you and I can be the same. Just get out there and remember it's the Lord working through you. It's his message. You, are, you and I are just conduits to truth. Pray with me, will you? Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you've given us something that is timeless, that you've given us something that doesn't require uh, <laughs> strategies or, or buildings, doesn't require uh, props or programs. It only requires faithful men and women who are willing to share what they know to be true with a world that is really <laughs> searching for truth, whether they know it or not. Lord, help us to focus on that which is your priority, and in doing so, complete the mission you've given to us as followers of you, the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.